Chapter 1 discussions will cover introductory information on auditing and other assurance services provided by auditors and the types of roles auditors take in society and in the profession. In Chapter 1, we will also discuss the common types of audits performed by auditors, including the requirements for becoming a certified public accountant. At the end of Chapter 1, you should be able to do the following. You should be able to describe what audit means, be able to distinguish audit from accounting, explain the importance of auditing in reducing information risk, be able to list the causes of information risk and explain how information risk can be reduced, be able to describe assurance services, distinguish audit from other non-assurance services provided by a certified public accountant, differentiate the three main types of audits, identify the primary types of auditors, and lastly, be able to describe the requirements for becoming a certified public accountant. What is auditing? What is the nature of auditing? By definition, auditing is the accumulation and evaluation of evidence based on verified information, and it involves the application of an established criteria or an established audit standard. An auditor or person doing an audit is expected to be competent and independent when performing and completing an audit. To do an audit, information used by the auditor must be verified and must be based on an established criteria. Criteria could be a standard in which to evaluate audit information. The criteria for evaluating information will vary depending on the information being audited. Take for example a, a CPA firm that has been engaged by a company that sells widgets and the company has asked the CPA firm to audit its historical financial statements. The criteria the CPA can use to evaluate the historical financial statements will be based on the standards established by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or the CPA or auditor can also use the standards established by the International Accounting Standards Board. Auditors and entities being audited they usually agree on an established audit criteria well before the audit starts. An established audit criteria with verified information is an important aspect in accumulating and evaluating evidence. Because audit involves the accumulation and evaluation of information as evidence, the auditor must determine whether the information stated is according to the established audit criteria or audit standard. Evidence gathered by the auditor can take many forms. It could be in electronic and documentary data related to transactions. It could be evidence in the form of written and electronic communication with outside or external individuals. It could also be information based on observation done by the auditor. Likewise, a testimony from the oddity or client is also a form of evidence for the audit. But regardless of the form of evidence, it is critical that in every audit that the auditor must obtain sufficient quality and quantity of evidence in order to satisfy the purpose or objective 
of the audit being performed. Why is it important for an auditor to be competent and independent when performing an audit? A competent auditor can be defined as an individual who is not only qualified to understand the established audit criteria, but is also an individual who has the ability to know the types and amounts of evidence to accumulate and evaluate the accumulated evidence in order to reach a proper audit conclusion. In addition, an auditor is expected to strive and maintain a high level of independence to keep the confidence of users of the auditor's report who are relying on the auditor's conclusion based on unbiased audit evidence accumulated and evaluated during the audit. The final stage in the auditing process is the preparation of the auditor report. Reports differ in nature, form, and type, depending on the scope of the audit performed. But do keep in mind that all reports do communicate the auditor's conclusion, or what we call audit findings, to users of the report. In, in this slide, we have figure 1-1. Figure 1-1 illustrates the key parts of the audit process. In this particular example, the audit process begins where the internal revenue agent accumulates and then evaluates unbiased evidence through examination of the oddity or in this case the taxpayers council checks and other supporting records. The federal tax return information filed by the oddity is then verified by the IRS agent. The same information is then evaluated through the use of an established criteria or standard. In this particular example, the criteria or standard that will be used or was used by the internal revenue agent would be the internal revenue code and all related interpretations of the code. Upon completion of the audit, you know, the IRS agent would come up with an audit conclusion. In this example, the IRS agent has conclusively reported on the tax deficiencies identified in the auditor's tax return. As figure 1-1 is a useful diagram in learning the audit process, I, I do recommend that as a student that you go through this illustration after the lecture or presentation in order to further learn about the process. So what makes auditing different from accounting? Most auditing usually is concerned with accounting information. And because of this information, some financial statement users and the general public as well has considered auditing as the same with accounting. The confusion between auditing and accounting needs to be clearly clarified as there is a distinction between the two. The, the purpose of accounting in comparison to auditing is to provide relevant financial information to decision makers. 
in order to provide information to the decision maker, economic events are recorded, classified, and summarized by the accountant on a timely basis. In addition, the accountant does this process in a logical manner and at a reasonable cost. In terms of the difference between auditing and accounting, it, the focus of auditing involves accounting data. And in auditing, the auditor is trying to determine whether the recorded information reflects the economic events that occurred during the accounting period. In evaluating whether the accounting information is properly recorded, the auditor or person performing the audit uses the U.S. or international accounting standards as the criteria for the evaluation. In addition to understanding accounting, auditors are expected and must have the ability to accumulate and evaluate audit evidence based on the information gathered and used during the audit. Why is auditing important in reducing risk? Decision makers use relevant financial information in making business decisions. Auditing reduces the risk that the information used in the business decision was based on inaccurate financial information. What causes information risk and how is the risk reduced? As the business environment becomes more complex, decision makers are more likely to receive unreliable information. The causes of unreliable information can be due to several reasons. One reason could be the remoteness of information. A global economy creates a challenge for decision makers to receive first-hand knowledge. Decision makers must rely on the information provided by others, which increases the risk of the information being misstated, whether it be intentional or not intentional. Likewise, if the goals of the person providing the information is inconsistent with those of the decision maker, the information received by the decision maker may be biased to the goals and motives of the person providing the information. The provider of the information is trying to influence the decision making towards the provider's own goals and motives. Another reason for unreliable information used in the decision-making process is the volume of data involved. Higher volumes of transactions increases the likelihood of undetected errors being included in the large amount of information. If many minor misstatements remain undiscovered, the combined total of unreliable information can be significant in the decision making. In addition, the existence of complex exchange transactions in the business environment can also increase the risk of information being unreliable. Increasing complex transactions leads to an increase in complex standards. Consequently, 
complex accounting standards make it difficult to properly record financial information. How is risk related to unreliable information reduced? The user of information can reduce risk by verifying the information. For example, the Internal Revenue Services verifies business tax returns to determine whether the tax returns filed reflect the actual tax due by the taxpayer to the federal government. Another example would be for the user to examine the records for the source of information to obtain the reliability of the information. This, however, is often costly and impractical to do. Another way of reducing risk is for the user of the information to share the information risk with management. Management is responsible for providing reliable information to users. If users rely on the information provided by management and as a result incur a financial loss, the user of the information may have a basis for a lawsuit against management. Lastly, the, the most common way for user to obtain reliable information is to have an independent audit of the company's financial statements. In this particular case, the external auditor is hired to perform the audit and provide assurance to users that the financial statements are indeed reliable. Decision makers can use the audited audited information on the assumption that it is reasonably complete, accurate, and unbiased. Figure 1-2 illustrates the relationship among the auditor, client, and external users. Uh, this relationship exists when the auditor is hired by a client to perform an audit of an entity's financial statements. The auditor performs the audit and then issues a report that gives assurance to users of the financial statements regarding the risk of the information that was provided by the client. So what are assurance services? How is audit different from other assurance services and non-assurance services? By definition, assurance services is an independent professional service that improves the quality of information for decision makers. Business decision makers engage independent professionals to perform assurance services in order to improve the reliability and relevance of the information used as a basis for their decisions. Assurance services can be done by certified public accountants or by a variety of other professionals. The need for assurance is not new. CPAs have provided many assurance services for years, such as assurances about historical financial statement information. Large public companies are required to comply with the provisions of Section 404 of the Surveillance-Oxley Act and Section 404 of the Act requires assurance from a CPA on the company's internal control over financial reporting. CPAs perform different types of assurance services. 
one category of assurance services provided by CPAs is what's called attestation services. By definition, an attestation service is a service in which the CPA issues a report about a subject matter or assertion and that is made by another party. Let us discuss the primary categories of attestation services performed by CPAs. The, the most common assurance service provided by CPAs is the audit of historical financial statements. This type of attestation service are designed to provide reasonable assurance in that the financial statements are free of material statements. In addition, um, the auditor issues a, a written report expressing an opinion about whether the financial statements are fairly stated in accordance with the applicable accounting standards. Another attestation category is the audit of internal control over financial reporting. Section 404 of the Surveillance-Oxley Act requires auditors for larger public companies to attest to the effectiveness of internal control over financial reporting. This evaluation, which is integrated with the audit of the financial statements, increases users' confidence about future financial reporting because effective internal controls reduces the likelihood of future misstatements in the financial statements. Another type of attestation service is the review of historical financial statements. Reviews of historical financial statements provide a, a lower level of assurance in comparison to audits. Many non-public company uses this attestation service to provide limited assurance on their financial statements without incurring the cost of an audit. Certified public accountants in, in most recent have expanded the application of attestation services to a broad range of subjects. Um, many of these services are, are natural extensions of the audit of historical financial statements as users seek independent assurance about other types of information. So what are other assurance services? Other assurance services are services that do not meet the definition of attestation services. These assurance services differ from attestation service because the certified public accountant is not required to issue a written report and the assurance does not have to be about the reliability of another party's assertion about compliance with specified criteria. The primary goal of assurance services is to improve the quality of information. This goal is normally not the primary purpose in non-assurance services. Consequently, most accounting bookkeeping, tax, and management consulting services are considered non-assurance services because they fall outside the scope of assurance services. Uh, table 1-1 provides several examples of other assurance services. I do want you to please read this table after the course lecture or presentation to gain an understanding of each type of other assurance services and the service activities associated with each. Um, you can find table 1-1 on your textbook on page 11. What are the three main types of audit and how do they differ from each other?
auditors perform three primary types of audit. These are operational, compliance, and financial statement audit. Let's first define what operational audit is. By definition, operational audits focus on the evaluation of the efficiency and effectiveness of any part of the organization's operating procedures and methods. In, operate, in, in operational auditing, the reviews are not limited to accounting. They can include the evaluation of the organization's structure, computer operations, production methods, marketing, and any other area in which the auditor is qualified to do an audit. At the completion of an operational audit, management normally expects recommendations for improving operations. Moving on to the other type of audit, how can we distinguish operational audit from compliance audit? Compliance audits are performed to assess whether the oddity is following a specific procedure, a rule, a regulation that is usually set by some higher authority. Governmental units such as school districts are, are subject to considerable compliance auditing because of extensive government regulations. For example, an auditor will perform a compliance audit to assure that a school district is complying with the requirements related to its federally funded grant programs. This type of audits are, are usually compliant types of audits. Having defined what operational and compliance audit is, let's move on to the third type of audit, which is the audit of financial statements. In the audit of financial statements, the auditor gathers evidence to assess whether the financial statements, which is the information being verified, are stated in accordance with specified criteria. The specified criteria used by the auditor is usually the U.S. or international accounting standards. I do want you to note that most of the discussion and focus on your textbook and the information that we will cover during this course usually will pertain to financial statement audits. Um, but given that we now are able to distinguish or you're able to distinguish between the different types of audit an auditor can actually perform, operational, compliance, and financial statement audits. Table 1-2 provides examples of the three types of audits that we just discussed in the previous slide. Uh, it also provides the information audited, the established criteria used for the audit, and the available evidence to support the auditor's conclusions. Um, I do want you to please read this table after the course lecture or presentation to gain further understanding of each type of audit. Um, table 1-2 is on page 12 in your textbook. What are the primary types of auditors and how do each type differ from each other? Several types of auditors are in practice. The most common are auditors working for a CPA firm, a governmental accountability office, or an internal revenue agent, and an internal auditor.
So what do auditors working for a CPA firm do? CPA firms are most commonly hired to do financial statement audits. However, some CPA firms have expanded the scope of service beyond just performing financial statement audits. Because your textbook focuses on financial statement audits, we will focus on this type of audit during the course lecture discussions as well. In order to express an opinion on the financial statement, an auditor must be a licensed CPA. Auditors working for a CPA firm are usually called external auditors. What is uh, a governmental accountability office auditor? Well, this type of auditor usually works for the governmental accountability office, which also is called GAO. GAO's primary responsibility is to perform the audit function for Congress. Audits are, are performed on financial information prepared by various federal government agencies before it is submitted to Congress. Because the authority for expenditures and receipts of governmental agencies is defined by law, there is considerable emphasis on compliance with laws and regulations. Likewise, there is an increasing audit effort devoted by auditors to evaluating the operational efficiency and effectiveness of various federal programs. GAO auditors are highly regarded in the auditing profession due to their use of advanced auditing concepts their audit responsibility of the federal government expenditures, their eligibility to be certified public accountants because of their governmental accountability office experience, and as well, their opportunities for performing operational audits. So how does an internal revenue agent differ from a GAO auditor and an auditor who actually works for a CPA firm. Well, IRS agents perform examinations of taxpayers' returns to determine whether they have complied with the federal tax laws. Tax laws are highly complicated that IRS agents are usually expected to have considerable tax knowledge and auditing skills to conduct an effective audit. We have uh, talked about the, the other types of auditors. We've talked about an auditor who works for the CPA firm. We have discussed about an auditor who works for the Government Accountability Office. And we have distinguished the Internal Revenue Agent. Now, let's move on to the other type of auditor, which is the internal auditor. What is an internal auditor? Internal auditors are employed by many organizations in all types of industry, in both the private and public sector. Internal auditors' responsibility vary considerably depending on the employer that they work for. To maintain independence, internal auditors must report directly to a high executive officer or what is called the audit committee. However, internal auditors cannot be entirely independent of the entity as long as an employer-employee relationship exists. The types of audits that uh, internal auditors usually perform are compliance auditing and operational audits. And I think we have discussed this type of audits in previous slides as well. So what are the requirements for becoming a certified public accountant?
The use of the title Certified Public Accountant or CPA is regulated by state law through the licensing boards of each state. Uh, each state has its own regulations for becoming a CPA and retaining a license within the state of licensure. It is possible to transfer the CPA designation from one state to another, but some states do require additional requirements to be met. There are three general requirements for becoming a CPA. The three requirements are formal education, passing the uniform CPA examination, and the required professional experience as stated in each state law. A figure 1-3 gives in detail the requirements for becoming a CPA. To meet the educational requirement, most states now require 150 semester credit hours for licensure as a certified public accountant. Some states require fewer, but still require 150 semester credits before receiving the CPA certificate. Most professionals who have become a certified public accountant had an undergraduate or graduate degree with a major in accounting. The other requirements to becoming a CPA is for an individual to successfully pass the uniform CPA examination. The examination right now is computer-based and offered at various testing centers. Currently, there are four sections of the examination. There is a section for auditing and attestation, a section for financial accounting and reporting, a regulation section, and a section on business environment and concepts. Some states also require a separate ethics examination. Professional experience requirement to becoming a certified public accountant varies widely for each state. For example, some states require no experience while another state will require at least two years of professional experience. Any individual considering to getting a licensure is recommended to check the requirements of the state in which the individual plans to get her or his certified public accountant license. As we have reached the, uh, the end of the chapter discussions, uh, I do want to remind you to please complete the required evaluation method for chapter one, as this will be part of your final grade. Homework and quiz are due by January 12. Uh, please use Blackboard and Pearson's My Lab, also called My Accounting Lab, to complete your homework and quizzes. Please access the video for chapter two for the next presentation of the course.